Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from OnlinePhotographyTraining.com. Welcome to my video series, Mastering Lightroom Classic CC. I suspect that many of you have never heard of me, my website, or my YouTube channel. So in this, the first video of this new video series, I just wanted to quickly give you some background information about me. I became a professional photographer in 1980. I actually worked for two different professionals. I was their assistant, their apprentice, their second shooter for a couple of years. Then in 1982, I broke off on my own and I created or started my own photography business called Creative Edge Photography here in the Buffalo, New York area. I've been teaching photography for about 15 years and online for almost five years. And this will be my fourth video series on Lightroom. Now my thing is all my videos are free. They're always going to be free. I will never charge for a video series or offer some content for free and the more advanced content will be a fee. Everything's always free and I'm able to do that because many people donate to me. They um, buy my presets. I sell a lot of presets for different products, profiles. I sell the raw files for this video series. I do have some other stuff I sell. And there'll be information for all that stuff in the description below this video. Now, as far as Lightroom is concerned, I mentioned that this is my fourth video series on Lightroom and it will be my most extensive and involved video series. This first video though may frustrate some of you. I like to call it quick start because I know many of you don't need to watch all 30 odd videos of a video series. You just want to get the highlights of the program down, see the things you should be doing, and then you're going to experiment on your own. Well, that's what this video is for. Others may just want to get an idea whether or not the program is for them. And again, that's what this first video is for. Now, one thing to be aware about Lightroom is you cannot just like put an image and start working on it. You have to really import your images into Lightroom. So to begin with, I am showing you my desktop. And over here on the right-hand side, you could see that I have an XQD memory card already plugged into my computer. Typically, that's what you would do. You would be taking pictures. You would pull out your memory card, plug it into the computer, and or plug your, um, your camera into your computer. Then you would open up Lightroom. Now, in my case, just let me say real quick, I just threw some images on this card. I didn't actually just go out today and take these images. These are actually kind of old. But it's going to serve our purpose. Now, we're going to open up Lightroom. And when you open up Lightroom for the first time, this is what you're going to see. You don't have any images in Lightroom, so it's going to be pretty much blank. What you need to be aware is along the top are the different modules of Lightroom. The first two modules, the library and develop modules, where you're going to spend most of your time. The library module is the digital asset management module Lightroom. That's where you're going to have your images. That's where you're going to move them from folder to folder. You're going to maybe edit the metadata of your images, you're going to delete images, stuff like that. You're going to do that all in the library module. Next to that we have the develop module and that's where we're going to actually process our images and we're going to do that in a minute. Then beyond that we have some modules that are very unique to Lightroom. The map module, book module, slideshow module, print module, and web module. And I will have individual vid videos on all those modules in the future. Now on the left and right are the panels. The panels are unique to the module you're in, so they're going to change. The information on these panels will change from module to module. One thing to be aware, that within the panels are sub-panels. They're often called tabs. You'll hear, hear me refer to them both ways. For example, while we're in the library module, we have this quick develop tab or sub-panel, keywording tab or sub-panel, and so, far, you know, so forth. So they're all these sub-panels. And on the left-hand side, similarly, we have subpanels as well. Along the bottom is the film strip. This is once we have images in Lightroom, they're going to show up on the bottom in this film strip and you could use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move from image to image. And when you have an image selected, it will render in the middle. So you'll see what you're doing. Now, as I mentioned, we have to get some images in here. So we have to import them into Lightroom. 
If you're in the library module, it's super easy. In the bottom left-hand corner, you have an import button. Just click on that and you can import. If you're in any of the other modules, that import button won't be there. In that case, go up to the top file menu and go down to import photos and video. And you can see there's a keyboard shortcut and you can see there's a lot of keyboard shortcuts. There's probably hundreds of keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom and they do make life a lot easier if you learn them. I do have a listing of all the keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom available on my website. Again, there'll be a link for that below this video. So we're going to import the photos off this card. So I'm just going to click on that and the import dialog box comes up. And we're going to cover this import dialog box in depth in our very next video because there's a lot you could do right here. But right now, if you have a memory card in your computer or your camera is just plugged into your computer, Lightroom should have found the images right away. And you can see they're all listed right here and they have little check marks. If the uh, box is checked, you're going to import that image. If the box is not checked, you will not import that image. So you could actually cull your images right here if you wanted to. If for some reason Lightroom didn't find your memory card, you could go over to the left hand panel and you could find it yourself. Drill down to where it is and then highlight it. You might have to drill down to the folder on your memory card that contains the images and they'll show up here. Once you have the images showing in the middle, at the top you have two different choices. You could copy them as a DNG file or copy them as is. Typically I just copy them as is. I shoot uh, RAW files, I shoot Nikon and Fuji mainly, so you're going to have, in my case, Nikon or Fuji RAW files. In this case, these are Nikon files. A lot of people like to convert them to DNG. DNG is kind of a universal RAW file format that was invented by Adobe. I'll have a video more detail about that in the future. Move and add is grayed out because you cannot do that from a memory card. We'll talk about that more in the future and other things you could do over here in the future. Now the right hand panel is feature rich. There's a lot you could do here. First of all at the top under file handling there are previews. What kind of previews do you want to build? You can see there's four different ones. Minimal, embedded in sidecar, standard, and one-to-one. -one. As you move from top to bottom, the previews get bigger. So if you're at minimal, you're using the smallest preview possible. It will take up the less, least amount of dis, uh, disk space on your computer. But it will take longer to render. What I mean by that is if you're in any of the modules and you have that film strip along the bottom and you have one image selected and you use the arrow key to move to the next image or you use the mouse to click on a different image, it will take the image longer to render into this middle area if you're using minimal. If you're using one-to-one, -one, they'll render very quickly, but they take up more disk space. So I keep mine on standard usually, so I'm going to leave it there. You can see when we're done, it's going to import the images, and then after the images are imported, you'll see a progress bar in the top left-hand corner as in the background, it's creating those standard previews. So you could work while it's creating the previews. It just takes a little longer for it to actually create them. Then we have a checkbox, don't import suspected duplicates. If you put an old memory card in here with images you already imported into Lightroom, if this box is checked, it'll have them all unchecked. So that just guards you against importing images twice. You can make a second copy to a different location. You could add it to a collection. We'll talk about that in the future. You could rename it uh, as you're importing it. We'll talk about that in the future. There's two different things, well, technically three different things you could apply during the import process, a develop setting or a metadata setting. These are presets, two different types of presets in Lightroom. There's a develop setting preset. Those will actually process your image. I sell presets um, that with one click, you hopefully will get a fully processed image. Well, if you have a certain preset you really like, you could actually do it during the import process. I'm going to leave it on non, none here. Metadata is with me. I have a preset I called import preset. That puts in all my copyright info, my name and address and all that stuff into the image. You could also add keywords. So in this case, these were images taken at a zoo. So I could add the keyword zoo and I could just hit enter. And once I do that, every image when it's imported will get that keyword edit, 
entered to it or added to the metadata. You could add more than one keyword just as you're typing them in. Put a comma in a space after each keyword. Below that is the destination. Where are we going to save these to? Now I happen to have a folder on my computer on an external hard drive. So I have an external hard drive on this computer called Photos. That external hard drive, I put a file outside of Lightroom. I created a file called RAW Files. You could call it anything you want. You don't have to call it RAW Files. You could call it Lightroom Files. You could call it, you know, um, Melinda's Pictures. You could call it anything you want. It happens to be there. What you would do is find it. It happened to find it automatically. But you may not, it may not. You have to go to the hard drive that it's on. It's on my Photos hard drive. It's on right there, that there and you can see how it's putting the date. There are some options about how you want to save it. Do you want to save it by date or just into a folder? So if I just wanted to go into this raw files folder, I could have it do that. I could click this subfolder and I could call this Buffalo Zoo. And just like that, it will put it into the raw files folder into the Buffalo Zoo folder. Then I could also come in here and go by date. So it will go raw files, Buffalo Zoo, date. So we'll talk about this more in the next video. This actually probably isn't the best way to import your images into this type of fire, uh, file hierarchy. Um, this is the way I actually do it and I found out that it's not the best way to do it. But we'll talk about that more in the future. But for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to just do it that way. When you're to this point, you could import them now. So they're going to be taken off or they're going to be copied from. They're going to stay on the memory card. They're just going to be copied from the memory card to this external photos hard drive into this folder when I click import. And you can see then we'll go to the library module. And the, as the images get imported, they show up on the bottom on the film strip. We have a progress bar in the left-hand side in the top left-hand corner. And once they're completely imported, the computer will make a ding noise. You may not hear it through my microphone. But once they're imported, there's the ding. Now it's building the standard previews. And again, that does is done in the background. So we could start looking at these images. So we'll click on the first one. And there's an eagle. So we could just use the arrow keys and page through these images just like this. And we can find one that we want to process. So we could go through just very quickly. Now we're going to get into culling and, you know, uh, marking our images with different flags and color labels and all that in a future video. So let's go through. Let's very quickly for the sake of this demonstration, let's just pick an image kind of like that one. So we're going to do this Eurasian link. So we're going to process this image. So we're going to go to the develop module. We'll just go up in the top left hand corner click on the develop module. Now we go over here. Now the panels are slightly different. The film strip's the same. We still have our images down here. In the left-hand panel at the top we have the navigator. If you just click on it, you'll zoom in on the image and you kind of move around and maybe you use this to look and see how the focus is on your image. Make sure nothing's blurry. Something like that. Below that are several more sub-panels or tabs. I'll get to these in the future. One thing I want to point out right away though is the history tab. You can see we have our import uh, process listed there. Every processing step we do to our image will get listed in the history panel. Everything you do in Lightroom is non-destructive. That means nothing is getting written directly to the image. You're going to be editing your image and all those edits will be written into the Lightroom library. And when you click on an image that was edited already, you're going to load the unedited image into the preview screen, but then Lightroom's going to overlay on top of that all of your edits that you have listed, and it's stored in the Lightroom library. So it's totally non-destructive. Every step is preserved. So you could go back. Let's say you did something. You went down a rabbit hole, and you didn't like it, but... 10 steps before that, it was perfect. You could go back 10 steps and go right to the spot where you liked it. So that's where a program such as Lightroom 
is really beneficial to the photographer. You're never writing, writing directly to your file. Even if you crop your image, you will not be cropping away pixels. It's just fantastic in that regard. You're never going to lose anything because your image is always preserved, the original raw file in this case. So that's the left panel. Over on the right panel, we have tools. We have a histogram, first of all, at the top. And you can close these down with these little triangles. Those are called expose triangles. So we have a histogram. Below that, we have some tools. We have a crop tool, spot removal tool, red eye tool, a gradient or graduated filter tool. That's one of the local adjustments. The other local adjustment is the radial filter. And next to that's the last local adjustment, and that is an adjustment brush. And with those, you could like brush in um, contrast. You could brush in noise reduction, or you could use a gradient to make the sky darker, or you could use the radio filter to vignette a uh, subject or something like that. And we will cover all these tools in future videos. This image, I don't think we need to do anything with any of those tools. We're going to start with the basic panel. Now, it doesn't matter. You could, you could jump anywhere you want. You don't have to go to this basic sub-panel or tab first. You could do effects first if you want. You could do detail first if you want. It doesn't matter. You could jump all around. You could do it in any order you want. You don't have to do so that, uh, move the sliders from top to bottom. You can move those in any order you want. Everyone has their own way of doing this. So I'm going to obviously show you how I do things, but make it work for you and see what works you know, best for you. Now, one thing I want to point out real quick, and I want to say it in this first video, if you do not have all these sub-panels, I get this email all the time. Most commonly, people say, I don't have a basic panel. How could you process anything without this basic tab? Well, right-click on any of them. Just go into this area right here and right-click, and you'll see this little menu pops up. And you can see how all these sub-panels have check marks next to them. Well, if I click on this basic, I removed that check mark, so I actually removed that tab from this right-hand panel. To get it back, just right-click and then click on it again, and you'll get that tab back. So if you're missing any of these tabs, that's how you would get it back. Now, we're gonna, I start usually with the basic tab, and along the top, if I want to make it black and white, I could do that right away, right away where it says Treatment. Go back to Color. I'm going to make this a color image or keep it a color image. Then we have different profiles. Profiles are how Lightroom will interpret or render color, contrast, tone throughout the image. And it comes, you know, it's going to usually come in with Adobe Standard. But if you click on this little, uh, like, brick thing right here, you have these different... Um, profiles that come with Lightroom. So we could go to a monochrome profile, landscape profile, neutral profile, portrait profile, a vivid color profile, whatever works for you. Also, there's some color matching, camera matching. These are profiles that are specific to your camera. This specific camera had flat, landscape, neutral, portrait, standard, vivid. Now, one thing to keep in mind, every camera is different. Also, a JPEG will be different than a RAW file. You won't have as many choices with a JPEG as you will with a RAW file. Or for with a TIFF file, you won't have as many either. So that's why it's always better to shoot RAW. The RAW image generally is flatter and not as handsome looking out of the camera, but there's so much more you could do with it. So these are the profiles. Also, you could pick profiles up from third parties. I sell profiles. You can see there's more Ganty landscape profiles if you want to get landscape looks to the, to the uh, links. But those are profiles. I'm just going to go with the profile that was uh, defaulted to Adobe Standard. We'll do this more in future videos. I know I keep saying that. Below that is white balance. There's a lot of different ways you could affect the white balance of your image. One is this drop down. If you're shooting raw, You'll have all these choices, auto, daylight, cloudy. You can click cloudy and it gets warmer looking. Click shade, it gets even warmer looking. If you're not shooting raw, you won't have those choices because the white balance gets baked into the other types of files. Like a JPEG will have the white balance 
cooked into it. You won't be able to really easily switch it with that dropdown. Now you can switch light balance whether you're using JPEG, TIFF, or a RAW file with these temperature sliders. You could just move the temperature sliders. Alternately, you have this little eyedropper. You could click on that and you want to find something that's neutral gray in the image, in the scene, and then click on that and that will give you a white balance. When you're done with this, put it back by just returning it to this little holder right there. So I'm going to go with as shot. That's fine. We're going to cover this in excruciating detail in, I think, two more videos. So look for that. Next, seven or six sliders are the tone sliders. So you're going to affect tone with these sliders. You could get an auto setting for all these sliders by clicking right here. And it gives you an auto what Lightroom thinks these sliders should be set at. Also, it will also give you an auto setting for the vibrance um, and saturation sliders. They call it presence. Now, if you don't want to use auto, just um, you could undo it by hitting Command Z or Control Z. That will bring you back one step. That's Command Z if you have a Mac, Control Z if you have a PZ. That's Z as in zebra. So we're back to where we are. Most of us don't like to use these auto settings. Or we're going to use a piece of the auto setting, and I'll talk to, about that in a minute. But this image is exposed properly, so I don't really have to use the exposure slider. But uh, if you did, you'd move it to the right to increase exposure, move it to the left to decrease. If you need to reset any slider back to its default position, just double-click on the name of the slider, and you'll reset that slider back to its default position. Now contrast, I usually add to the image, but I'd like to add it a little later. I don't do it right now, so I'm going to skip that one and come back to it. Next we have highlight shadows, whites, and blacks. Everyone has their own way of doing this. Usually what I like to do is with the highlights and shadow slider, I like to make the image flat. So that means I'm going to take the highlights and bring them more towards mid-tone, and I'm going to take the shadows and bring those more towards mid-tone. And then I'll bring back contrast with the whites and the black slider, and that usually works best for me. So what I'm going to do is, in this case, to follow along in that chain of thought, I'm going to go to this highlight slider and move it to the left. So I'm going to make the highlights darker and bringing them more towards mid-tone. Now how much should you bring it? Well, it's really up to you. Some photographers bring highlights all the way down and shadows all the way up. And when I initially was teaching Lightroom, I taught beginners to do it that way because it actually works very well, and it's an easy way to do it. I encourage you to experiment. See what works for you. Usually what I would do is I zoom in on the brightest part of the image. It looks like it's the cat's fur over here. And then I'll bring the highlights down until I see detail in the fine hairs that when highlights was up at zero, it looked just like a white blob. But as I bring it down, I'm starting to see those individual hair details right around there. So that looks good. Then what I'll do, I could just drag around by when I'm zoomed in by clicking in and look at the darker parts of the image. And then I'll go to shadows and I'll move that to the right because I'm bringing those more towards midtone. So I'm making the shadows brighter. That's called opening up the shadows. So you can see I move that to the right and that looks pretty good to me. Then to zoom back out, just click on the image again and we'll zoom out. So I made the image look relatively flat. Now if you want to see a before and after or where you are in your processing, hit the Y key on your keyboard. You'll see the before on the left and the after on the right. And you can see there's not a big difference on this shot. Hit the Y key again and we're back to our processed image. Now if you want to see a before and after in a different way, and this won't work for everyone because not everyone has this key on their keyboard. It's a backslash key. If you click the black backslash key on your keyboard, if you're lucky enough to have it, you'll see the before and the after. Before, after. Because So you can see now I made it flat. The before had a lot more contrast. The after, it's a lot flatter. I mentioned I bring that contrast back with the whites and black sliders and with the contrast slider. Now, as far as these whites and black sliders, these are probably the two most difficult sliders for people to adjust in Lightroom. There's a number of different ways you could do it. You could get that kind of um, partial. I mentioned there's a partial auto adjustment you could do. Instead of clicking auto and have it adjust all of these sliders, you could do it so it just adjusts whites and or blacks. 
To do that, to get that auto adjustment, hold the shift key in and double click on the word whites in this case. And you can see it gave me that auto adjustment. Hold that shift key in and double click on the word blacks. And that will give me that auto blacks adjustment. So there's before and there's after. So you can see how we're getting somewhere now. There's the before image. There's the after image with actually only these four sliders adjusted. Nothing else has been done to this image yet. Now there's another way you could adjust whites or blacks, which is not quite auto, but it will help you maybe adjust a white and black point that might be better for your scene than this auto adjustment. I'm going to reset them by double clicking on the words whites and blacks. And for this adjustment, what you need to do is hold in the Alt or Option key. It's Alt if you have a PC, Option if you have a Mac. When you hold that key in and click on, let's say, Whites, you'll see the entire screen will turn black. Move that slider to the right. And as you move it to the right, you'll see colors start to bleed through. You'll see red, green, blue, and then ultimately you'll see white. What that means is you're starting to clip those color channels. When you see blue, you're clipping the blue color channel. Similarly, if you see red or green, you're clipping those color channels. If you see white, you're clipping all three color channels. Well, what does clipping mean? Well, that means that you're making the highlights so bright that once they clip, you're losing all detail. All the detail has been obliterated. You just kind of whited them right out. Usually, you don't want to do that. So what you want to do is you want to take this, hold that Alt or Option key in, move this slider to the right till you see stuff start to bleed through. Then back it off until you get that totally black screen just barely. That's a very good white point. Similarly for blacks, hold that Alt or Option key. Again, it's Alt if you have a PC option. If you have Mac, click on that black slider. This time the screen turned white. And this time you're going to move the black slider to the left. And then you'll see, again, red, green, and blue bleed through, but you'll also now see black. Black is when you're clipping all three channels. You're going to move that and back it off. Now, in the case of animals and portraits of people, I usually don't want any clipping at all. So I'm going to move those so there's no clipping at all. In the case of a landscape image, I like to clip the blacks a little bit. It's For me, at least, I think it adds a little more depth to the scene. So for me, if I'm doing a landscape image, I would hold the Alt or Option key and adjust whites just to the point where nothing is clipping, and then I'll adjust back blacks so just a little bit clips. And then I'll look at it. If I like it, I like it. If not, then I'll move them. All right, so for this, I like it. Now I'll jump back up to Contrast. And I'll add some contrast to the scene like that. Now to give you an idea, I'll hit that backslash key. There's before and there's after. Now below that we have these so-called presence sliders. Clarity, dehaze, vibrance, and saturation. Clarity adds what is called mid-tone contrast to the image. When you move it to the right, it's going to look like you're making your image sharper. It's a very, very powerful slider. Be careful with it though. You could move it quite a way, but on some images, if you move it too far, you'll get some smearing. Specifically, if you have, let's say, a very bright sky, a bright blue sky, and you have a dark tree going up through that sky, if you move clarity up too high, the dark bark of the tree will start to blur and smear out onto the bright blue of the sky. So you want to avoid that. So you don't want to go too far with this slider, even though you could kind of go pretty far. So I think around 30. Looks pretty cool. Below that is dehaze. If you took a landscape image and you have haze in the sky, move this to the right to remove the haze. Move it to the left to add haze to your image. Um, in the case of a portrait or an animal shot, it's up to you whether you want to do anything with the slider. It doesn't hurt it. I mean, it's really up to your creative uh, decision whether or not you want to move it. I'm just going to move it slight, plus seven. Now, vibrance and saturation, I get questions all the time about vibrance and saturation. What's the difference? Well, vibrance will increase the saturation of every color in the image unless that color was already saturated. So, and it will also bring colors to saturation, but not oversaturate anything. So vibrance will, I guess, is a, is a little lighter handed than saturation because what saturation will do 
is it will saturate every color in your image and it will oversaturate colors. Even if a color is already saturated to begin with, it'll oversaturate it even more. So saturation is a little more heavy handed. The other thing with vibrance is it doesn't affect reds and pinks as much. So if you have a human in your picture with pink skin, the vibrance slider might be a better choice because you won't be making their skin super red looking or increasing the vibrance of their skin. So vibrance might be a better choice. And just to demonstrate, if I move vibrance around, you can see how it affects the colors in the image. Now, if I go over to saturation and I move that around, you can see how it kind of does a little more. And this image isn't super colorful to begin with, so I don't think it matters which of these sliders I move. But I'll move vibrance to the right. And I'll move it kind of high so we could see some color. So plus 30. So there's before and there's after. So you could see we're getting somewhere. I'm not going to move saturation at all. Now below the basic sub panel or tab, we have several more tone curve. We're going to cover, we're going to have a video where I, we cover this extensively. We have the HSL color tab. This is where you could really adjust just one color. So if you want to just adjust the hue, saturation, or luminance value of yellow, let's say, I could do that right here. So it'll only affect the yellows in the image. The saturation, let's say a yellow. So I can move that and only affect the yellows. So that really helps you adjust your image to your creative vision with these HSL sliders. This image, we don't really need anything. Split toning, you could tone the highlights and or shadows of your image. We'll get to that in a, new vi in a, in a future video. I know I keep saying that. Detail. This is really noise reduction and sharpening, and we're going to do that with this video. Typically, you should do noise reduction first. Outside of Lightroom especially, if you sharpen first and then try to reduce noise later, it's harder to reduce noise. Now in Lightroom, these two subdivisions of this tab, that is the sharpening subdivision and noise reduction subdivision, they kind of look, they kind of work uh, with each other. So it's not as important to do noise reduction first, but by habit I do. What I do is zoom in. So just click on the image so you get a one-to-one -one view and I could see the noise in the image. And there's two different types of noise you could remove with the noise reduction part of this detail tab. That is luminance noise and color noise. Now there's no color noise in this image. Uh, usually that's little red, green, and blue specks in the image. That happens usually with an older camera, maybe a, you know, even a camera. When I say older, maybe a camera's five years old because it's this has improved. Cameras have improved that much in the last few years. But an older camera and the scene was underexposed. You typically get a lot of color noise, especially in the darker parts of the scene. There are none here, so I don't have to worry about that. By default, Lightroom put a plus 25 on that, but I'll just leave it there. Luminance noise. If I move that to the right, you'll see that it will just smooth over that noise. Hopefully you see that in the video. Now, if you go too far, you got to remember it's not only going to smooth over noise, it's going to smooth over some of the detail too. So you want to make sure that you're moving this just enough to get rid of the noise, but not obliterate any detail. If you move it to the point and you think that it's good, go to this detail slider, move that to the right, and you'll rescue some of that detail. Move it to the left and you'll blur things out even more. So move detail to the right. Again, I'll have a detailed video on the detail panel. Um, probably one of my more popular videos I've ever done for any of the video series has been the, the actual video I do on the detail panel. So that's noise reduction. Sharpening, just move the amount slider to the right and move around, move to a uh, part of the image that you want to make sure it looks really sharp like the cat's eye maybe and move it. Again, you don't want to go up too high. If you over sharpen an image, it just looks horrible. So you want to be careful with the sharpening slider. Radius detail and masking, we'll talk about those in a future video. Super powerful sliders and they come in super handy. So that's detail. We want to zoom back out. Just click on the image again. We'll zoom right back out. Lens corrections. Usually Lightroom will find the uh, actual lens you used. You may not have these uh, boxes pre-checked. 
If not, just come in and check them. The first is chromatic aberration. That's little purple, sometimes green little lines you'll get in high contrast edges on your image created by your lens, usually a cheaper lens. You'd get it all the time. More expensive lens with all those expensive coatings, usually you wouldn't have it. It doesn't hurt to check it, so just check it. Enable profile corrections. Again, you click that. Hopefully it found your lens. In this case, it found my lens. If it didn't, you could look for it. The first drop-down is the make of the lens you used. The second drop-down is the model. Now, there are going to be some instances where Lightroom does not have the actual lens you use loaded into its lens profile database. I'll have a video on this sub-panel, and in that video, I will discuss what you could do if your lens is not included. Now, the reason why you have lens corrections, I should say, is that all lenses add some type of distortion to the scene, no matter what, and this helps uh, correct it. When I unclick Enable Profile Corrections, you could see how the image kind of gets corrected. So we'll cover this panel in more detail. Transform, we'll talk about that in a future video. Effects, I like to add a vignette to my image. So that's considered a, uh, an effect. If I go to the amount slider, move it to the right, I'll get a white vignette. If I move it to the left, I get a black vignette. I'm just going to add a very slight dark vignette. The reason why is I like that is it helps draw the viewer's attention more towards the middle of the image. Below that is calibration. We'll have a video on that. So I consider this image, though, to be completely processed. There is a before and there's an after. I could hit the Y key and you could see them side by side, before and after. So pretty well done, I think. Uh, Lightroom made it very easy. Now I need to export this image so I could share it with the world. Now to do that, the keyboard shortcut is Shift Command E. Now remember, go to my website and you could get a uh, listing of all the keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom. To export, you also could go up to File, Export. And the Export dialog box comes in. And I know I keep saying it, but in a future video, I'm going to cover this export box in detail. And I already kind of pre-filled this out to make this go a little quicker. What you would do is decide where you want to export your image to. I'm going to export it to the desktop. Um, how am I going to name it? Well, it's going to be called Links, and then it's going to have a dash, and it's going to have one. We'll Again, you could do this all different ways. That's just the way I'm going to do this specific image. I'm going to export it as a JPEG. I could have exported it as a PSD, TIFF, DNG, or I could just export the original RAW file. I'm going to do the JPEG. The color space will be sRGB. The quality, I'm going to put it at 100. Doesn't really matter. We'll get more detail on that in a minute or in next video or in future video. You could limit the entire file size. I'm not going to do that. Now resize it. I'm going to resize this image. One thing I should say, let me close this down real quick. See up here in the top left-hand corner, this info? That shows the, the name of the file, the date and time it was created, and also the size of the image. 5,568 pixels by 3,712 3, pixels. I don't need to export this humongous image. If I'm sharing it on Facebook or on Instagram or something like that, they're just going to downsize it anyway. So... I might as well downsize it myself. If I hit the I key on my keyboard, I'll get some different info. I'll still get the name of the file, but I also get the actual exposure info, 180th of a second at F8, ISO 400, and then the lens info. I used a Nikon 200 to 500 millimeter lens. It was shot at 700 millimeters because I also used a Nikon 1.4X teleconverter. So I was zoomed all the way out and shot this, zoomed all the way in, I should say, at 700 millimeters. I hit the I key again, and all that info goes away. Hit the I key again, and we're back to that first screen. So you could toggle through two different pages of information and no information at all. So again, we're going to export this. Um, it's a JPEG, 100% quality. Now I'm going to resize it. I'm going to share this on Facebook. It has been my finding that at Facebook tends to mess up images, but if you export it, at 2048 pixels, that tends to render the best on Facebook. If you're exporting for um, Flickr, Instagram, 1080 usually works really well. And especially with Flickr, anyone could download images that you put on Flickr. 
So if you put this full-size image on Flickr, someone could steal it, and they have the full-size image. But if you put it at 1080, there's not a whole lot they could do with it outside of viewing it on their computer. Resolution 72 is the resolution you should use for viewing online, someone looking at it on a computer monitor. If you're going to print it or send it off to a lab to be printed, you want that resolution considerably higher, around 300 usually. Below that, the metadata that uh, my copyright info, my name, uh, you know, all that lens info, all that stuff, I'm going to include all of that. You have choices of what you could include or exclude from your exported metadata. Watermarking, do we want to put a watermark? We'll cover that in a future video. And what are we going to do after we export it? Well, I'm going to do nothing. You could show it in this case because I'm using a Mac Finder. If you're using a PC, it would be a Windows File Explorer. Um, we could open it up in Adobe Photoshop or a plugin or something like that, but we're going to do nothing. And we're just going to click export. So we're going to export this image. Now, over here, we'll see the progress bar in the top left hand corner. When it's exported, you'll hear a ding. It just exported. Now, I get this question all the time. Once you export it, what do you do with the original file? Well, you keep it. Don't delete your original files. Remember in the old days, those of you that are old enough like me, when we shot film, we brought it off to a drugstore, we got our packet of pictures back, and inside of that packet were little strips of negatives. Well, we, those negatives were valuable. If we wanted to get more prints, we had to bring that negative in to get more prints. Well, if you want to export this image to a different size, someone wants to buy this. They can't buy that 2048 long-edged image to make a humongous print. It's not big enough. You have to send them this entire file to make a big image. So save this. Don't delete your original images. They're important. This is where the library module comes in. This is where you manage your images. You keep them forever. You go over here to folders, and you can see it's right here. I have all these images, and as I add more images, more images, they'll be put into these folders. And just keep them organized. That way, when you need to export it for another reason, you could export it in the exact format it needs to be in and the exact size it needs to be in. Now, we're exported. Where is it? Well, I exported it to the desktop. It's right there. And there's our exported image. Just like that. So, quick start. I know <laughs> it wasn't very quick. This is the longest video that's going to be in the series. All the other videos are going to be much shorter. I thank you if you've made it this long. I thank you very much for watching it to this point. And i just like to thank everyone that watches my videos. I truly do appreciate it. In our next video, we're going to cover that import module in detail. So check for that. In the video after that, I think the next video that would be after the import module, we're going to be culling and organizing our images. So look for that in the third video. Again, thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you guys soon.